Mainly I'll talk about property and probably hotels, as that's my area of expertise. I think when we look at property, really the downturn in terms of pricing and everything else doesn't go back six months, doesn't go back to the subprime crisis. Probably goes back about two years to the time of the tax and coup d'etat when we saw pricing really level out at that time and peak. So during the past previous two years going forward, we've seen prices maybe move up artificially, but certainly the economy has not moved forward. I think a number of risk analysts in Asia Pacific have tagged Thailand from about a year ago saying that this was an area of high risk because the government really had their head in the sands dealing with domestic issues at the same time that maybe the governments in places like Singapore or Hong Kong were looking at an impeding economic crisis in the West and saying we're starting to plan for that. Thailand had their own set of problems, so really we're behind the ball. I think one positive that we always look back in is that anybody who's been in Asia quite a long time, you go back to 1997, and there's been on-the-job training here in Asia for a financial crisis like this. You know, the Thai banks certainly, and certainly the um, service industries have been prepared and they've seen things like this happen, so it's not nearly as catastrophic as happened really in the West because there is less gearing. So I think there are positives out there certainly going forward, but also certainly right now some negatives in terms of political risk and really the planning by the Thai government and implementing reforms right now. Thanks, Bill. Um, and one, one, just following up on that, uh, you've noticed how the Thai bar seems to be staying pretty solid. I think that's probably a reflection of how the banks have learned from 1997 and were not involved in Lehman's and so on to a very great extent. Um, as a result, people will see the Thai bar as, despite all the political rubbish that's going on, See, it is still quite strong. Okay, thanks. Um, I'll just comment on obviously the things I, I see in the newspaper. Um, uh, basically, obviously, ad, ad sales are down, so people are not spending on advertising. Uh, that's, uh, that's come along with the, with the economy. Um, overall, um, Basically, for example, people are obviously trying to sell assets, um, uh, whether it's uh, their cars, um, uh, their property, homes, etc. Um, we see that in, in our classifieds. Um, there are a lot more people trying to trying to sell their assets, um, uh, but obviously people not too willing to to buy them uh, at the moment. Um, so I mean that's obviously that's what we see. <coughs> excuse me, um, in the newspaper uh, as far as uh, people trying to the effects that the, 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 the economy is having on on, on people. Uh, the, uh, the delay in, uh, in the summit to, until I guess October, and uh, how has that affected the uh, hospitality industry? And what other effects uh, do you think, from a PR standpoint, uh, on a worldwide scope, uh, would that uh, have? Actually, I think it might be a blessing in disguise. It was uh, cancelled, certainly, because there was the element of risk involved. And if anything would have gone wrong during the incident, the benefits would have far outweighed the actual downside. You know, tourism, always you go back to, to something called big event syndrome. It's not always very possible. Whenever you have big events like the Olympics or these type of things, you have a spike in occupancy for a very short period, but you're also displacing your own high-season business. You know, granted this was going to be during low season, but it really wasn't going to do much for tourism on a broader scale. So it's not the end of the world losing this event. You know, Phuket has to go back and work on the fundamentals of tourism and how we're going to replace the markets which are right now gone. You know, really right now where Phuket is, is maybe five years ago. Phuket traditionally has been a very high low season destination, but during the past few years it became unseasonal. You know, Phuket was always full of tourists. Right now we're seeing for the first time maybe a step backwards and that it's a seasonality is quite high, so we're seeing low season again. So it's how are we going to find the basics to drive business back during low season again. So I think the, having the Asian conference not here is not necessarily a bad thing. You, you might say about seasonality, but what about the yield? I mean, uh, hotels are selling out with a rack rate, should be at 10,500. They're selling for 980 bar tonight. I mean, that's a crisis everywhere. Certainly, when you go in Asia right now, you're seeing a downtrend in terms of average room rates, certainly. I think Phuket has some blessings in terms of the hotel market in because fixed costs are relatively low against other parts of the world. So you are able to make money here at low occupancies. 
but at one point really you have to say how much lower can you go. Really the priority is to drive occupancies back and try to find new markets which are going to come back to Phuket. You know, I think we've had good, good news this week with uh, Virgin Blue from Australia. They're announcing that they're going to start flying to Phuket. They're waiting for permission. We're seeing good airlift as well. So fundamentals still are strong for Phuket, but right now we have to say that we're feeling the after effects of all the hotel markets region wide. Phuket's not in this alone. Bangkok is much more affected. Even markets like Singapore, Hong Kong as well, their occupancies are plunging as well. So it's, it's always easy to say that things are worse here in Phuket, but you have to take a broader scale. Things are tough all over right now. So it's really finding uh, how, you, how you can make your business work right now and finding cash flow. You know, we're seeing certainly in the property market as well with, with the Thai listed companies or even on the smallest businesses possible. How can you meet cash flow right now? That's the imperative. Um, I, I have a couple of examples. I have a couple of examples here, and, and we'll ask you guys as well how, how you manage this. Um, I was talking to Martin Platz, the um, golf teacher. Have you met him? Golf pro. Or guru. The golf guru, that's right, yeah. Uh, also known as Mr. Balls or Mr. Putts, is that right? Um, he said he's never had it so good. Part of the reason is that a whole bunch of business people who play golf for business have now decided they've got time to improve their game. Um, so they're going to him for lessons. Uh, another is um, Sue Usher, Lady Pai, who uh, has managed to persuade her husband to leave his lucrative job at Banyamu uh, and join her in running the company because it's getting too big for her and she's taking on staff. Um, with Martin's case, it's fairly obvious why that's happening and I presume uh, if the downturn continues long enough, the people who are taking golf lessons will no longer have the money for them. But, um, in Sue's case, I think it's very much that people are used to eating five-star restaurants are downgrading to four, those who are in four are downgrading to three, and so on. People are watching the money, and she's benefiting from it. 